Hello, my name is Bob Luton. I have spent the majority of my career doing two things. The first is really the creation uh, or helping create educational materials for emergency physicians and nurses to care for children that are critically ill. I began with the uh, PALS course and with the APLS course. I was involved in the creation of those two. And currently with the airway course, I'm responsible for the pediatric content uh, of that course. The second thing that I've been doing and, and continue to do, uh, working with Jim Broslow and Peter Lazar, is uh, to eliminate the barriers that these folks have when they care for children. And principally because of medication dosing that has to be done in an emergency, there are many issues involved that need to be resolved. Throughout that process, what has become very apparent is, is this is a very error-prone process. I think a couple things are known but not really known. The first is that errors are extremely common and they're usually the product of a bad system and they're not the fault of the provider. Unfortunately, many providers have lost their jobs, there have been punitive action taken because of the errors, and they've even taken their own life because of guilt, because of the feelings they have when something drastic occurs from a medication error. What I'd like to do for you right now is go through an exercise to show you how bad the current system truly is. And it's somewhat tongue-in-cheek in the sense that we're going to allow us and talk about developing the worst possible system we can and then compare that to the current system we use to treat children in emergencies. Let's look at then uh, how to design a bad system. These are the elements you would probably want to want to put into it. First, you would try to find a complex risk-averse problem, which for us will be medication dosing. Secondly, you would have the least prepared provider to give those medications. Thirdly, you would probably want to put them in the worst possible environment to function. You would eliminate any helpful clues and then throw in everything else you could possibly think of. We'll call that the kitchen sink that made it more difficult. The last two things you do is just make the results of the, whatever you've done undetectable so you don't know that you've done it right or wrong in the moment. And then lastly, have everyone come together and agree that what needs to be done is really unrealistic. And I'm going to go through and, and go through one by one and we'll look at each of these steps. Let's look first at finding a complex risk-averse problem. Obviously what we're talking about is medication dosing. So what could be more risk-averse than giving a medication that has to be given immediately to a child or he will die? So that is our risk-averse problem that we're going to try to develop a system that supports this. Is it a complex problem? Well, for adults, it's not that complex. The dose we know for uh, epinephrine is usually a milligram. It comes in a, a vial or an amp. A uh, doctor knows to order one milligram. The nurse knows to pick up the amp and to give that medication. Not the same with kids. A doctor has to know what, how much the child weighs. He has to remember the dose. He has to calculate the dose. He then gives that medication uh, order to the nurse, who then pulls up a vial tries to figure out how many milligrams are in each mill, then calculate that dose, then give that to the patient. And not, not infrequently, several medications need to be given at the same time. So we now have a problem that is very risk averse, complicated, and with high, it's at high stakes. Secondly, let's make the person who probably has the least experience be the one to do this. What do I mean by that? Well, Probably the best person to do this would be someone who gives these medications on a daily basis, actually pulls them up, gives them, and looks at, and monitors the effect, a single person. Probably the one that does that the most would be an anesthesiologist. Uh, paramedics also do it. Uh, vets do it. But that would probably be the best person to give these medications. But we're not going to do that. Let's look at having one person order the medication and another person giving it. So the first person has absolutely no idea what concentration it comes in or whether the concentration is, that is used is correct or not. The second person then has to take that dose, calculate it, and give it, and see if it indeed works the way it's supposed to, but has no idea if this is the correct dose. Examples would be probably the best people to do this in that scenario would be a pediatric emergency physician, a pediatric emergency nurse, or perhaps a pediatric pharmacist. The worst probably would be an emergency physician, an emergency doc. Why are they the worst? Well, only about 10% of children in this country are treated in pediatric emergency rooms. 90% of children are seen in general emergency departments. In those general emergency departments, more than 50% of 
general emergency departments see less than 10 children a day. And those children don't tend to be very sick. So there's very little experience with, for these providers with critically ill kids. A normal emergency physician in his practice might intubate a child every one or two years. And studies and surveys have shown that they feel uncomfortable and readily admit they are uncomfortable with the care of critically ill kids. So who do we select? Well, let's select the emergency physician and the emergency nurse as our ideal providers in a bad system to take care of this issue. Okay, number three, let's put them in the worst possible environment we can in order to function to make sure it doesn't work. Well, what's the worst environment you could put them in? Well, let's look how they function normally. There's a book engineers use that they refer to when they design projects. And in that book, it has all the normal things you would want to know in designing a project. For example, if you were designing, say, a book for someone, and you would obviously look at a book for a four-year-old, you want to know what the fourth grade reading level is. If you were designing a book for uh, someone who's 80 years old, you'd want to know how large the print needs to be. In other words, it has all the different factors you would need in order to do a project. In that book, it points out that under normal conditions, when mathematical calculations are done, a good person, a smart person, will make an error 3% of the time. If someone is checking behind them to make sure that the, the mathematical calculation is correct, 10% of the time they make a mistake. They just assume it's human nature, they assume that what was done prior to them is correct. So they make a mistake about 10% of the time. If it's done under stress, normally what happens under stress is people will make a mistake about 25% of the time. Now, you have my word for it, but let's look at a couple examples. This example of 3 to 10%. Let's look at two specific examples. The first is, this is a paper that was published. It was published by a smart person who saw the problem with epinephrine dosing for anaphylaxis and for cardiac arrest. And in his paper, he wanted to point out which concentration to use for which one. This figure here shows exactly one of the figures that was in the paper. And it shows at the top, it says, and this is the concentrated solution, it says, clearly labeled pre-filled syringes containing upper box, which you see here, 0 0.3 milligrams of the 1 to 10,000 concentration in an auto injector. That's for anaphylaxis. In the lower box, it says for cardiac arrest, use the 1 to 10,000. In other words, there's a mistake here. It should have said at the top for anaphylaxis, 0 0.3 milligrams of the 1 to 1,000 concentration. So there was a mistake made. The person who was trying to tell us not to make a mistake made the mistake. It's just human nature. How I many of you have balanced a checkbook and instead of coming up with a balance of $500, come up with $5,000? We realize that's a mistake. We do this all the time. In this situation, a mistake was made. Worse than that, this was sent to an editor who sent it to reviewers, who sent it back to the person that, that went through and edited the paper, and then it was published. So multiple people afterwards saw this and the mistake went all the way through, showing this very common for a 3 to 10% error to occur depending on the situation. This is another paper put out by the ISMP, the Institute for Safe Medical Practices, the premier organization, probably saved more lives than anyone relative to medication safety. In this paper, the author points out that if you confuse kilograms with pounds, you can get a twofold error because one is roughly twice as much as the other. In the paper that he says, one pound equals 2.2 kilograms, which is the opposite, which is the error he wanted to point out. It's actually one kilogram is 2.2 pounds. Again, the same thing. Smart people making math-related issues, and when they show it to someone else who check it, they make a mistake also. What about the last one? Is it really 25% under stress? Do you think under stress you make a 25% error? Here's two studies. The first we did. In this study, we used simulated mock codes. We had pediatric nurses and nurses in general hospitals calculate doses. In our study, 25% of the time, the calculation was an error. 25% of the time. This is another study, and this is actual emergency department experience where observers watched why people were nurses were actually mixing medications. And in that study, all errors included, not just mathematical, but wrong patient administration errors, etc. One out of every two doses was done in error. So it's very, very common to have these errors. It's very common for them to occur, especially in emergencies. So let's look at a couple of projects here. If you were going to do three different projects, would you want humans to do it 
or do you want it somehow automated or computerized so there wouldn't be any mistakes? Let's look at the three projects. First, uh, if you were trying to fill ice cream containers and you were designing something to fill that, would you be comfortable with a, a human figuring out how much ice cream to put in? Probably not higher risk. If it's a little bit too much, a little bit not enough, that's okay. It'd still fit. No big deal. What about if you were designing landing approach calculations for a 747? Would you want humans to do this where three of the ten percent of the time they'd be wrong, where the airplane would crash? Obviously not. You want this computerized and automated. Well, let's look at number three. If you wanted life-saving pediatric medications given in an emergency, would you want humans to do it or would you want it computerized or automated? Well, what do you think we're going to do? Let's have humans do it and let's have them do it under stress. That's the worst possible way you could actually do it to make sure that you have a bad system. What about helpful clues? Make sure you eliminate any helpful clues. Here's an example of a helpful clue. If a physician orders an amp of bicarb or an amp uh, of epinephrine or the dose of epinephrine, which is one milligram, and the nurse trots out with a wheelbarrow with 40 or 50 amps of medication, everyone, including the cleaning lady, is going to know there's a mistake made. But let's look at the 10 times error. In this slide here, you see 10 times what was ordered, and obviously it's an error to everyone. Here's the same mistake with the pediatric patient. Both medication volumes fit in the same syringe, so we've eliminated any helpful clue that there might be a problem in this situation. Let's just throw in the kitchen sink. Put in everything else you can possibly think of. First, let's make labeling inconsistent. Is the product 1 to 10,000, or is it 0.1 milligram per ml? Is the product 20%? Or is it 20 milligrams per ml? Is the product 500 milligrams per 50 ml? Or is it 5 milligrams per ml? Let's make the print too small to read. With medications, for some reasons, everything has to fit on something the size of, of a postage stamp. And once you reach a certain age, you can't read it. Let's go a step further. Let's make the products indistinguishable. These are three different medications. And from here, from where I'm sitting and where you're sitting, they look exactly alike. Now, if you really want to have a bad system, make life-saving medications look exactly alike so when you pick up one, you get another and have no clue which one you picked up because they look exactly alike unless you can read the small print that you can't read. Let's make key meds unavailable. We all know about the medication shortage where one day you've got one medication you're used to giving, morphine 2 milligrams per ml, the next day it's 4 milligrams per ml, but nobody's told you that, or you didn't remember that, or you just normally fix it a certain way and it's abnormal to fix it a different way. Throw in low lighting, and then make communication absurd. What do you mean by making communication absurd? Well, we talk in math as if it made sense. For example, someone says the patient is on 3 micrograms. Well, how many micrograms should they be on per kilo? Well, the patient is on 3 micrograms per kilo. What's the normal number per kilo? Well, the product is 1 to 10,000. How many micrograms per mil is that? I don't know. What is a microgram? What's a milligram? Has anybody ever heard of a grain? These are all different ways of making communication where when you and I talk back and forth, we're probably not going to understand each other. Let's make the results that you have undetectable. And this is a, a thing that I don't think a lot of people really understand how prevalent this is. But let me show you an example. A 6.5 kilogram child comes in season. The doctor orders 0.7 milligrams of lorazepam, IV, for this patient. The seizure continues. He orders the dose repeated, and then the patient stops seizing, but he also stops breathing. What was the issue here? Well, when I was in training, we felt usually this was related to getting several doses of, of medication. What about a dosing error? Well, the doctor ordered 0.7 milligrams. Let's look at the chart and see what was actually given. Well, it says 0 0.7 milligrams was given, so obviously that's not an error. Wrong. If you look at the formulation that was used, it's 4 milligrams per ml. That means that this patient should have received 0 0.17 mLs, which is 0 0.7 milligrams. The patient received 1.7 mLs, which is 7 milligrams, which is 10 times the dose he should have received, and therefore he stopped breathing. Well, what was documented in the chart? Well, we know what was documented in the chart, 0 0.7 milligrams, because that was what was ordered. That's what nurses do. They don't know they make a mistake. They write on the chart the milligrams that were ordered. And this is a very, very common issue. And if you do chart review, you'll not be able to pick it up. I don't know how many times in my training I had patients that wouldn't stop seizing 
Ward that stopped breathing, and I felt it was uh, difficult to treat seizure, or I th thought it was a problem with the medications. And there's a good chance I gave one tenth or ten times the dose and had no clue, uh, nor did anyone else. Let's make ultimately the expectations that we have for our own performance in this system unrealistic. I've listed here what I call, or what we refer to as the five D's for safe drug delivery. These are things that everyone agrees upon. Everyone agrees that you should have the correct dose in milligrams, that the mills ought to be correct, even though we've shown how they many times aren't, that the dilution must be correct, the delivery must be correct, and that people who give these medications should recognize the dangers associated with the medication. Does it interact with another medication? Does it cause hypotension? Does it cause arrhythmias? And then the last thing that everyone agrees to, everyone agrees to, but no one does in an emergency, is double check the dose. Have someone else go back and double check that dose before you give it. So, let's just summarize. To make the worst system you possibly can imagine to give emergency medications, we first pick a, a child, a pediatric patient in an emergency. That's number one. We take the provider that's least prepared to do this. We put them in the worst possible environment, which is under stress. We eliminate any helpful clues. We then throw in the kitchen sink everything else you can possibly imagine that would make it more difficult. You would then make the results of what you did undetectable by chart review, and then you would still insist that it be done a certain way, and every person agrees, even the ordering organizations and bodies, that it should be done a certain way, which obviously it's not. So, how do we meet these expectations? Well, this is what we have to do in the face of this system we just talked about. And I'm sure you noticed when talking about this horrible system we just designed, that is exactly the system you're working in. There is no wonder that people make mistakes. And there's no reason whatsoever to feel guilty because you make a mistake in this environment. It's really surprising that we don't make more mistakes. How do we meet these expectations? Well, early on in my career, I met Jim Broslow, and he had an idea and I helped him with the development of this idea, and that was to measure a child with a tape. And when you measure him with a tape, then you get a length which corresponds to a weight. You then take the dose we talked about in milligrams. You calculate it. You put that on the tape. You then take the concentration that is used in this situation that has the milligrams and mils, and you calculate that out. So with a single measurement, for example, in this slide you can see epinephrine, 0 0.17 milligrams, and the nurse draws up 1.7 milliliters. That has eliminated most of the bad things in the system. We can go directly without having to stop and think and waste time to exactly what the dose that this child needs in an emergency. So this was uh, our, our initial effort in solving this problem in emergencies. However, there are many, many, many more medications used in emergencies and even non-emergencies where the same issues crop up in terms of a difficult or bad system. This is the information contained in our current system, or Artemis. Notice on the left here are the what everyone considers as essential information needed in, in, uh, for emergency dosing. Uh, and on the right is the information that can be pulled up immediately in Artemis. Notice one through five. First, you can check and see that the dose in milligrams is correct. It says here succinylcholine paralysis, so we know the indication is correct. It gives us the dose, and it gives us the dose in milligrams, so the nurse can verify, indeed, that the doctor's dose has been calculated correctly. It also has the dose in milliliters, which is actually the milliliters of a concentration that the nurse took out of the Omnicell or Pixis that we will demonstrate for you later. 3, 4, and 5 actually give you the information we talked about before in terms of is it correctly diluted, delivered, and are the dangers or warnings available at time, in real time, when it's needed. As you see here, that information of preparation, administration, dilution, and warnings or side effects is contained in this screen that you have right before your eyes so that the information you need is readily available immediately. Let me summarize then by saying that uh, I want everyone to understand that we're in a bad system and we have to work around it. This is what we think is a very good solution to that problem. In the next video, we'll demonstrate a physician and a nurse can access and use this system in real time in emergencies to dose children.